I'm Kathleen Jasper. This is part two of our Praxis Core reading video, where I go over specific questions you will see for each type of content category assessed on the exam. So in this video, we are actually going to break down specific questions and passages. Let's get started. So let's get started here with some actual questions. All right, so this is a typical short passage. This is on page eight of our reading guide. And you can see it's, it's by Joseph Conrad. It's a, it's a classic. This is a classic um, literature. And you can see here that I have one question attached to this passage. And this one question, let me, let me do, I'm going to try yellow again. There we go. This question has um, just one correct answer choice. I choose either A, B, C, D, or E. And notice this is the tone. It's asking the tone. Now notice in this situation, I'm going to color code my questions based on where they come from. So this comes from craft and structure. So throughout this presentation, you're gonna know that this craft and structure, this is a craft and structure because it's like a green um, teal color. And I do that in this presentation. So, and you'll get this when, when, when this is over. This is a tone question, one right answer. It's a craft and structure. And structure. You wanna be thinking about this. Now, let me show you another trick. Let's say, okay, you, you're like, Dr. Jasper told me to read the questions first, fine. And here I say the tone of this passage. Okay, I'm looking for tone. This is only one question attached to this, this particular passage. Really quickly, I gotta read this and I gotta think about tone. So I'm gonna think about how does the author sound. Now here's the thing I'd also like you to remember. I always say don't read the answer choices, but here's where I make a, an exception because the reason why I say don't read the answer choices is because um, there's four, or in this case, there's five, or no, there's four incorrect answer choices here and only one correct. So I don't want to just um, read all the answer choices because then I'm filling my brain up with like wrong information, right? So I want to do is as little of that as possible. I definitely need this first before I even read here. Most of you start here. You start right up here, you read, then you read the question here, then you have to go back and reread. And that's problematic because now you're wasting time. It's time um, saving if you read the question first, then read. Now I set the purpose, I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for tone or main idea or whatever the question is asking. Now, here's where I think reading the answer choices first is good. This says tone, and if I quickly glance down to my answer choices, notice I have optimistic, restless, oblivious, ominous, terminal. A lot of times, and again, we're gonna think like a test maker, not a test taker. When people write these items, and I used to write test items for Pearson, so I know how this works. Um, they start with, like in this case, these are all adjectives at the beginning of each answer choice. Well, this is very telling. We have optimistic, restless, oblivious, ominous, and terminal. So we've got, you know, a couple of positive words, opt, uh, optimistic, that's really the only positive words. Then we have restless, oblivious, ominous, and terminal. So keep those in mind. This is going to be a happy passage or a not so happy passage. Now in this case, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but the title says heart of darkness. So we're gonna go, I want you to look at everything. If a title is given, look at it. Sometimes it's given, sometimes it's not. Um, on ACT it's given, um, sometimes on Praxis it's given. But in this we have Heart of Darkness. Now this might be a gimme if you're an English major and you've read Heart of Darkness, you'll be able to see it. But if you haven't, you can see um, the sea reach the Thames stretched before us like the beginning of an intermediate waterway. In the offing, the sea and the sky were welded together without a joint. And in the luminous space, the tan sails of barges. So we've got all this description going, going over. The air was dark above. Gravesend and uh, farther back still seemed um, condensed into mournful gloom, brooding motionless over the biggest and greatest town on earth. So this sounds like mournful gloom. This sounds like something kind of ominous. Um, this doesn't look like, you know, it's not that the author is sure he will die. It's certainly not optimistic. I mean, that wouldn't give me there. Restless means I can't wait to do something. I don't get that from here. Oblivious means you don't care. You're totally clueless. And he's being very descriptive here. So I wouldn't choose that. Ominous, when you see dark, 
uh, above, uh, the air was dark above. When you see right now, it's about to rain outside my window. It's thundering. It is ominous out. The big thunder clouds come in, right? They're all coming in. So D is going to be your best answer there. But notice, I didn't even read that whole passage. I went, okay, optimistic, restless, oblivious, ominous, terminal. All right, let me go in here. And then, of course, look at this. At the end, you've got the answer there. So be strategic. That one is an easy one. Grab it and go, okay? Which then, and I'm not going to read this to you guys. This is in our book, but I'm not going to sit here. This, the thing with, um, just a quick side note, the thing with teaching reading online, it's really difficult, and some of you are going to have to do this because you're going to be teaching online here probably a lot of the year. Um, it's You don't want to sit there and read to your students online, so I'm not going to do that to you today. But this right here is an example of a longer passage. Now, the way um, Praxis is set up, you're going to have this long passage here, and then your answer questions will be on the side here, and you'll have to scroll up and down. But for the sake of my presentation, I know it looks different than it does on test day. But here you can see there are several paragraphs. Let's take a look at the questions that go with this. And notice here that I have a um, craft and structure question here in Teal, and then I have this integration of ideas here. And this is one of those choose two. So you might have two questions here for this longer paragraph or this, this longer long passage. Now, this is saying choose two. So this question is worth two. This question is worth one. So remember that. Now, please, when you're testing, don't try to go in your head, okay, that was worth two. I missed one of those. Oh, this is worth one. Because what you're doing there is you are using up valuable cognitive energy on trying to figure out your score when you should be using that valuable cognitive energy to figure out the correct answers on the test. So be, be careful there. And you know, you don't have to sit there for an hour and be like, is this a craft and structure question? Is this a key idea and details question? I don't want you to do that. I just want you to get to know the types of questions so you're really good at reading tests. That's going to help you a lot, okay? So in this case, you're gonna to have to choose two. And of course, you know, choose two of the following statements with which the author of the passage would agree. Reading this question first, is going to be kind of uh, getting the, you need to read it first, but this isn't going to yield any big time stuff until you probably read through the whole passage, right? And then it says, what type of publication would this passage be best suited? So that's another kind of tone, craft, structure. Where would I put this? And you might want to just quickly, if the answer choices are short like this, maybe just say, okay, a textbook, classified section, newspaper, biography, nonfiction. All right, let's, let's go back in. I'm ready to roll. I know what is being asked of me now. Let me start reading. Okay. And now we have, you know, just this first paragraph, an amusing incident leading to the exposure of manifest fraud. Okay, so now we know it's kind of amusing. Maybe the author's gonna be funny. It's gonna be a little bit more lighthearted. Maybe it's not going to belong in a textbook. Pretty much in a textbook, we wouldn't start with an amusing incident. You probably wouldn't start a textbook thing like that, but you might. Uh, you'd have to read further to figure it out. But notice, I read the question first, and as soon as I get that answer, like as soon as I read down here enough, I might be able to go out and grab this answer without reading anymore, you know? So go ahead and, and try that. Now, the other types of passages you're going to have are the double passages. Now, everybody freaks out when they get the double passages. And I am here to tell you that it's important that you do not freak out because the double passage is actually very easy. And what I want you to do with the double passage, and I want you to teach your high school, middle school, and elementary school kids this. They get double passages all the time on their state standardized tests. They give passages like this to little third graders. So if you think this test is difficult, I would encourage you to check out their third grade reading exam in the state of Florida or any state for that matter, and you will see just how difficult it is. And what do little kids do? When you give them a reading passage, where do they start? They start up here. They read all of passage one, then they read all of passage two, and then when they get to the, um, the questions, the test makers will trick you and they'll put all of passage one questions towards the end of the questions, like numbers eight, nine, and 10. So the kids, what they've done is 
They've, they've totally forgotten this passage here. I mean, that's gone. The only thing you remember, and this goes for adults too, the only thing you're really remembering is maybe this right here. If you start with the top of passage one, read it all the way down, top of passage two, read it all the way down. That is not the way to do this. Now, we train people on ACT um, to beat the reading test so they can get into Ivy League colleges. Please listen to me on the double passage. I'm telling you, it will change your life. Well, maybe not change your life, but it'll certainly make your test taking um, experience better. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to treat these passages like totally different passages. This is one task and another task. So you're going to treat it just like we said with single passages. You're going to go into the questions and you're going to look for only passage one questions, not passage two and passage one questions, passage one only questions. Now, if this is a short passage, if this is a short um, double passage, you may only have one passage, one question. You may have two. I'm talking about passage one only, not one and two, just passage one only. So you're going to read that. You can see here, I've got it here. So in passage one, the author's position on the topic is which of the following. Now, maybe that's my only passage one question. Now I'm going to go in and read passage one. Then I'm going to answer passage one's question. Why? Because if I don't do this and I go here and I read all of passage one, and I read all of passage two, and then I get to the question, and it says in passage one, and I go, oh my God, okay, hang on, let me go back to passage one and read it all again. You just reread it one, two, three, four times. I've reread this thing 40 times, you know? I'm, I have to keep rereading this thing over and over and over again. It happens to everybody. Don't do that. Don't do that. Start with the questions first. Okay, passage one, that's my only passage one question. I'm going to read passage one, answer passage one's question. Okay, now I'm going to go and look for only passage two questions, like this one here. Only passage two questions. Then what am I going to do? I'm going to go in here and read only passage two, and then I'm going to go back here and I'm going to answer passage two's question. Now, the beauty of a question like this, this is your craft and structure. This is a, um, um, in passage two, the term build. This is a vocab question. Okay. This is a craft and structure. That one's really easy. If that's your only passage two question, you've lucked out, go in here, find it. You know, this is such a shorty. I would read the whole thing because you're going to have passage one and passage two questions. But as soon as the word build comes out, and where is it? Oh, here it is right here. As Soon as you hit it and you figure out what it means, jump out and grab that answer. Grab the answers when you can, right? Now, um, and you can see here, I should have went to the next page. I skipped ahead. Let's say that there are um, four questions. Here's a passage one only. Here's a passage one only. So I'm going to read both of those questions, read passage one and answer passage one's questions. Then I'm gonna go out, grab passage two only. Let's see here. This is a both passage question, so I'm not gonna to touch it. So I'm gonna read, uh, read this question, read passage two, answer passage two question only, a passage two only question. Then now I have such a good, uh, understanding of both passages, because not only have I read the questions for both passages, not only have I broken up the passages and kind of understood them um, through backwards design, I now am going to easily be able to answer these double passage questions or both passage questions. Okay, I am telling you, this strategy will help you tremendously on the double passage questions. Now, another thing with these double passage questions, sometimes they'll do this. Passage one does this while passage two does this. And the answer choices will be long. And so when you see an item like this, and this is called an item, I talk about items a lot. It's the question stem any kind of chart or graph or picture or stimuli, and then the answer choices. That's what a, um, an item is referred to in the testing world, okay? So this item has long answer choices. And when you see these long answer choices, what are you like? You're like, ugh, more reading. Like, I gotta do more reading. Break them up, don't read all this. Here we have gen passage one generalizes favorably, all right? While passage two expresses cynical. 
already, if you've already read this because you've already answered the passage one only questions and the passage two only questions, you know right away if passage one is happy, favorable, and passage two is cynical. If passage two is not cynical, get rid of it. All right, now I'm not reading through this with you guys. A could be the right answer, okay? I'm just, I'm just talking about this um, in general speak, okay? And here you have passage one draws from enjoyable personal experience, um, while passage two generalizes anger. Pick out those pieces. Don't get caught up in all of this text here. We're saying author of passage one is happy. Author of passage two is, is mad. Now, if A is wrong because it, it's cynical, well, guess what? Anger and cynical are the same thing. So if A is wrong, B is wrong. Because you can't have A be wrong and B be wrong. So right away, I'm going to be like, boom, too similar. Anger and cynical is, is the same thing. Okay? And then go through and do that. Now you have here... Uh, one extends a cautious warning. So we just went from the, the author being happy, enjoyable. Now it's cautious, like maybe sending us a warning. That's going to stand out to you. You're going to know that. And then you have while passage two expresses doubt about the success. So go in and kind of don't just read from top to bottom. Play around, eliminate immediately. Go in, get these key words out, dissect the questions. And this takes practice. But I'm telling you right now, if you start at the top of passage one, you read all the way through to passage two, and then you go into these questions, you're done. Your, your time is going away. And that's what's making it complicated and difficult for people. Think like a test maker, not a test taker. All right? Now, let's talk about main idea in terms of how to hack this kind of question. Now, when I say hack, I mean kind of skirt around it and not, you know, make it shorter, make it simpler for yourself, okay? Of course, I want to go here first, okay? This is going to be a shorter passage. This is from the ETS study guide, uh, study companion, okay? This is from ETS. This is from their, um, their booklet that I just showed you online, okay? So they have this short passage here. It's just a paragraph here. And then it says the primary purpose. Now, here is where maybe reading the answer choices would help you, okay? Quickly, is it a critical response to the big band era? Is it some, this, this? Quickly skim. Don't get bogged down in it, okay? Now, primary purpose is code for main idea here. And when we're talking about main idea, there are a couple of things that test makers do. The first thing they do is put in information that was never mentioned in the passage, okay? It's some random, random statement, and it was never addressed in the passage. So you're going to want to immediately eliminate it, okay? That's number one. Number two, the thing they like to do is they like to put things that happened in the passage, but they're very specific, meaning they're not a main idea. While they happened, like let's say Sally went to the store and bought a candy bar, um, bought a candy bar happened, but it's not the main idea of the story. Maybe the main idea of the story is about Sally and her dog walking down the street and they just happen to stop into a store and buy a candy bar. That's one piece of the story. The main purpose is the overarching details here. So this one I am going to do with you because it's short and I don't want to, you know, read to people online because it's like being... It's like having a PowerPoint read to you. How many of you love that? Professional development time. I'm going to read my PowerPoint to you. No, that is not what you want, right? But I'm going to just do this one with you. Hopefully you guys can see it there. I zoomed in a little bit. So we're talking about the primary purpose of this passage. So I'm like, okay, let me think. Main idea. Let's go. Here I go. Jazz is the most original aesthetic form to emerge from the United States, but it has not always been the most popular. Okay, not always been the most popular. That sounds like a main idea. Like it's telling you it's, it's old school, but it hasn't always been uh, super enjoyable for people. After the big band era of the 1930s, most jazz was played in small rooms that held about a hundred people. The sound systems were usually bad and the players were considered to be small time entertainers. If the music was strong enough, however, the audience would quiet down or sh a shout approval when something especially sw swinging uh, was played. Unlike in the more polished venues found recently, the particip participation of listeners was, for was not forbidden and people were not expected to keep absolutely quiet until the song ended. So we're talking about participation from the audience. Okay. There are some 
specific details in here, like the 1930s and the big band thing. But overall, this passage is about the audience, the audience screaming and carrying on versus being quiet and all of that. So let's go to the, the answer choices here. Now, I've already read my, my question or my, um, my task, and I know I'm looking for the main idea. So A, describe the critical response to jazz just after the big band era. Now, it mentioned big band era, but it also talked about um, some other things in here. So this feels specific to me, um, but let's, let's move on. I'm, I'm, I might get rid of it. It did happen in the passage, but it's a little too specific, okay? B, discuss how jazz performers have been affected by their audience Never did we talk about jazz performers. We talked about the big band era, the small rooms where it was held, but it didn't really talk about the jazz performers. No. Indicate how audience response to jazz has changed over time. All right, this audience response to jazz, I like. I'm going to go back and check just to make sure. C is my front runner. Uh, a is, mm, okay, we got a critical response, but now we're talking about audiences. C, C is my front runner. D. Recount the author's experiences of listening to jazz. Nowhere does this talk about the author's experience. Out. E, outline the historical origins of jazz. While we did say 1930s here, that's not the main purpose. This is where they like to get you. They didn't outline the historical origins. It was about the audience. Now, I've narrowed it down. Let me just check and make sure it's not A and I can go with C. So we've got jazz is the most original aesthetic, but it has not always been the most popular. After the big band era of 1930s, most jazz was played in small rooms. The sound systems, if the music was strong enough, however, the audience would quiet down. Unlike in more polished venues, um, recently participation of listeners was not forbidden. So we've got this found recently. We have the 1930s, but we also have this found recently. Notice that they went from a date to a more general kind of today kind of deal. So this just isn't about the big band era. This is about indicated how audiences response to jazz has changed over time. They used to yell and scream in the jazz rooms or whatever. And now I guess when people listen to jazz, they sit quietly and wait till the thing is over and then they clap or whatever. So that is why C is going to be the best answer there. Okay. And, um, notice A is pretty good. You might've tried A, you might've grabbed it because you remember big band and you, it's saying a response and it does talk about the big band is too specific. They talk about the big band era only for a second, and then they go on to talk about found recently, which is today's era. So be careful there. That's a quick hack. Pay attention to general details. We want, look how general this is. Look at the language of this. Indicate how audience response to jazz has changed over time. We have big band era, too specific. We have uh, experiences, these are out, these are out, but anything too specific is not gonna be your answer choice. That's another trick, okay? Let's take a look at this one here. So you're talking about vocab like this, okay? Now, the term build means what in this passage? One thing you can do is find similarities. And in this question, you're only allowed to pick one answer. You're only allowed one answer here. So you can't have two of the same answers. Well, notice here A says asked for payment. And this one here says charged. Uh, asked for payment and charge. Both of those are the same. If I ask you for payment, am I charging you? Yes, I am. Guess what? Too close. I can only pick one answer choice here. So I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of those. There will always be something like that in the answer choices. So if you can eliminate, um, those types of things that will help you narrow down the process of elimination is very helpful here. And then what you can do is take, let's say you decide, um, Let's say you decide D, and I think D is the answer uh, for this one. I don't remember. I haven't memorized this particular passage. Um, I've memorized most of them, but not this one. Um, I think the answer is D. But then let's say I choose D, and I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of weird. You know, let me check. Go back into the passage and put it in here and see if it makes sense. If it rolls off the tongue and it kind of is like, yeah, that makes sense, grab it and go. If it's like weird and it's choppy, like for example, if I said these people are often, and I said described as, these people are often described as land and business owners. Well, that works, doesn't it? 
But if I said these people um, are often offered a settlement as land and business owners who sacrifice their homes, doesn't make much sense there. So that's another way with the vocab that you can you can implement it there. But you know you always want to be be thinking when you get the gist of the paragraphs and you understand more, um, it'll help you with that vocab. Um, you've got to read more. I am telling you, the more you read, the more vocab you're going to be exposed to and the better things are going to be for you. Look, what do we do? We scroll. We scroll, we scroll, we scroll, 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 scroll. We might even see, um, we might even see a, a, uh, good article that we want to read. What do we do? We click on it. We read the headline. We might scroll down, look for a bulleted list of something. If there's a video attached to it, we're watching the video. <laughs> and then we're not reading it. And I'm guilty too. I am not reading enough. I'm working too much. I'm not reading enough. I'm winding down with the TV. I should be winding down with a book, but I'm not. And uh, that is going to be the difference. When you read things like The Atlantic, write this down, The Atlantic, The Economist, you can um, just like them on Facebook and you'll get all of their um, all of their articles. Those are on the kind of level you want to be reading at and they have so much vocab that you're going to see again on your reading test. Please believe me when I say when you read things like The Economist, The New York Times, The Atlantic, and yes, these are more, um, these are higher level publications, okay? These are on a 1200 Lexile range, so they're going to be at the top. Um, these publications will have vocab in them that you will see on reading tests. And I know this because I read these publications all the time and then I go take sample ACTs or I take sample GKs and there the vocab is. So trust me with that. Plus, the more you read, the better you write, the better you, you, you speak, all of those. The Washington Post, somebody asked, what about the Washington Post? Grace, Washington Post is great. It's a little lower in the Lexile range. It's a little easier to read, but it's still great. Read it. Um, you know, some people, they're like, oh, she's, she's pushing the Atlantic and the New York Times. Find your, um, your good publication that challenges you. Not, oh, I like to read about sports, so I'm going to read the sports section of the newspaper. No. If you like to read about sports, then read something about politics or baking or tech or uh, finances. Something you're not used to reading. Get used to doing that. Grace, I love the Times, too. I love the Post, too. I love the Post. I love the Times. I read everything. I watch everything. I watch MSNBC. I watch Fox News. I read the Post. I read the Times. I read it all because it's really important to read it all. But if you have certain things you like to read, um, go against that because when you like to read something, it's easy. You fly through it. Try things that you're not used to reading. If you're not used to reading about tech, um, you know, read about something else.